a small premise uh, before getting into real action. Um, as Manuel said, I, at some point, I started talking about conceptual engineering um, before realizing that what I meant was probably distant uh, or at least confusing uh, for philosophers, given that philosophers, we are used to a Carnap style idea of conceptual engineering. And at least my scholarship went as far as knowing that Carnap uh, no, meant, had used the expression and meant something else. And I was just being uh, misleading in using the same expression. Besides, I didn't like the idea of engineering very much. Um, uh, I thought that it was too mechanical in a way, uh, if you pass me the joke. Design was, uh, was preferable. Um, and um, I will end this talk uh, explaining why I personally, and I don't have to impose this to anyone, I just say, no, when I'm doing philosophy, uh, and that's all I do anyway, uh, I know that's all I am, uh, the kind of philosophy that I think uh, should be done, uh, but again, uh, in my own corner, uh, is conceptual design. I see philosophy as uh, a way of uh, uh, designing um, open problems uh, properly and designing uh, convincing solid, robust uh, answers to those um, questions, those open problems. But this is for another day, not, not for today. Uh, I will, however, uh, hint uh, to this at the end of the talk. The talk is on something else. The talk is on design itself and the logic of in on information understood in a particular sense of information, which I will explain later on. You might have uh, already understood that uh, once uh, an analytic philosopher, forever an analytic philosopher, uh, there is no way of uh, uh, dropping that particular habit of trying to be as clear as you can possibly manage. It doesn't mean that you are clear, but it means that at least the attempt is there. <laughs> and if you're not, someone can put you straight and clarify even further. So um, here is the uh, presentation uh, of, the, um, of the talk. I will start uh, a little bit generic and I will end a little bit generic. The uh, nitty gritty will be in the middle. I'll start by uh, telling you a little bit about shortly, because I know this is not the topic for today, why I think that uh, uh, a you know, conceptual engineering for the seminar or conceptual design and uh, a logic of information uh, understood as part of the conceptual design is so important today. So I will start from by, by talking uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, information revolution. Uh, and as I said, you, know, you can expect it here some really broad uh, stroke uh, points. Uh, by introducing it in terms of uh, cut and paste. Um, that's what the digital has done to modernity. And I can say this to you because you understand, whereas now the, the average uh, manager of, of Google would say modernity was, uh, I thought we were modern. No, we're not modernity as in, you know what I mean, uh, modern uh, uh, age. It, it cut and paste uh, things that we assume to be um, atomic and therefore you couldn't cut both in terms of ontology and in terms of epistemology, what the world is like and what we think about the world, and pace to then get the things that we thought were completely independent, uh, both in terms of ontology and in terms of epistemology. This power of the digital to cut and paste modernity is what has made the transformation that we have under our eyes, and it is dramatic. Uh, as dramatic as the Industrial Revolution as the Agricultural Revolution. This is one of those big steps in human history. The counterpart of that cut and paste power is the design that also the digital has introduced uh, at the forefront. We always have had design as an important concept, and I'll tell you more about what I mean by it and why it is uh, part of the innovation. But you can think in terms of if you cut and paste the world and what you think about the world, then you can also have many more opportunities to redesign and design what you have cut and paste. That is you know, what I'm going to talk about for the first uh, part. Then I will start um, looking at the logic of um, uh, information as a logic of modeling the world. I'll introduce Kant and Hegel over there uh, to move to a logic of blueprint. Now, the difference between a model and a blueprint, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back to this, so, so don't worry. It's just, uh, as you were, the, the starter uh, of the main meal. Um, but a model is something that uh, captures, and I'm careful about captures, but if you like, you know, sort of, represents, so be it. I'm not too keen on representation these days, but captures something that is out there. So you have a model of a fridge. The fridge is in the kitchen. You model the fridge. A blueprint is 
not capturing anything because there's nothing in the world yet. So you have a model of something that is there or a blueprint that's something that needs to be put there. Uh, so you have a blueprint, for example, of a new car which hasn't been built, et cetera. So I will introduce this uh, there in terms of a, a logic that covers modeling and a logic that covers blueprinting, uh, if you pass me the uh, bad English. To move to uh, a synthesis of what I mean by uh, logic of design or design logic uh, for, for brevity, uh, and uh, understand that in terms of uh, uh, sufficing, which is a bad English, to make sufficient rather than necessitate. More on this, and finally, a few logic symbols over there, uh, but just shortcuts, nothing uh, that uh, should concern uh, anyone who hasn't seen them before. Uh, finally, to go, no, after the deep dive, back to the generic again, why it is important? Because the sciences that make a difference today, increasingly, are the sciences that do not represent the world, pass me the oversimplification, uh, and pass me the over so, uh, polarization. When I was in high school, no, chemistry, biology, physics, life is there, the elements are there, the world is there, and they try to describe it. But they are the poetic sciences, sciences that build their own subjects, uh, economics, political science, computer science. And so this movement from mimesis, representation, to poiesis is what makes a logical design so crucial today. And again, not because the past, we haven't seen this. I mean, you can go all the way back to Plato, for goodness sake, and, and discuss this in, in ancient philosophy terms, but because of the prominence, the priority, the emphasis on this as opposed to other things. So honestly, there's nothing 100% new here. It's the emphasis of what comes first and comes later, what is more important and more significant as opposed to other things that makes the difference. So anyone who already, no, no, hands, no, ready to say, oh, but we've seen this before. And trust me, I, I hear this all the time. Oh, surely, you know, the, nothing new. Of course, nothing new under the sun. I mean, you, you, you're born, you leave, you die. Welcome to the, uh, uh, a high level abstraction uh, description of human life. It's what you do in the middle uh, is the twist that makes the difference to a story that is uh, largely the same that I want to emphasize. And after that, reaching conclusion. Now, if you get lost, the map comes back. So just wait until the map uh, comes back and you are here will appear at some point. So um, as I promised, a little bit of quickly on cut and paste. So, and you can tell that I decided to uh, abuse the fact that you are philosophers. So that's what I mean. I mean, the digital is re-ontologizing and re-epistemologizing modernity. It's a mouthful and it's 100% clear. Not trick, uh, French-like, you know, big words, nothing behind. Nope. This is a former analytic philosopher talking. So trust me, there are concepts behind, behind you know, fancy words. Cleaving power. Uh, as you know, English has this funny word to cleave, uh, which means at the same time to separate and put together. Uh, uh, is the, to be honest uh, and fair to English is because it comes from German. Two words in German uh, that meant exactly you no know, to separate and to put together. Then they started, uh, when they were importing to English, they started getting the same um, spelling. And now to cleave means at the same time separating, but also uh, putting together. Um, hence, cut and paste. The concept is simple. I'll show you a couple of examples. They are big, and we could just have a single lecture on every single example I'm going to show you. So forgive me for the no, big uh, the, uh, talk uh, that is coming. But cut and paste should be quite clear. Remember, things that we have inherited from modernity, as a block now separated. And things we have inherited from modernity, united as it separated, or completely independent, now joined together as if it were normal. Of course, there's always been in our own culture today, two sides of the same coin. They were not in the past. So I'll give you a couple of examples of cut and, and a few a couple of examples of paste, and then we move uh, from there. Presence and location. Now, if you, <laughs> you, you will remember your, your Iliad, uh, Remember, when if you are a Greek god and you need to go and fight under the wall of Troy, you need to move. You need to get there. <laughs> you can't do it this at a distance. No, there's no telepresence. No, not even for the gods. Okay, so it means that your location and your presence, where you are physically and where you can interact with the world, are two sides of the same coin. No longer. 
And in fact, to my students you know, in their 20s, this sounds like, what's your point, man? And of course, yeah, well, trust me, it's a novelty. Because for people who were born in the 60s like me, yeah, if you wanted to go do something, you had to get there and do it. Uh, meaning, meaning, for example, that um, uh, bank branches were built when presence and location were two sides of the same coin. That's why they're disappearing. And is it reversible unless you offer coffee? That was a consultancy with a, a, a big uh, uh, bank in, in the UK. We say, oh, what, what can we do? Oh, you offer coffee to people? Oh, of course not. Well, that's the only way of, of not regluing together presence and, uh, and location, as every bookshop knows. And it's not to make another penny. It's a philosophical move to reglue together presence and location because the, the cappuccino, you have to come here. And just in case, yeah, I make a bit of money on the side, but above all, you are in the premise. You might actually look at the books. So um, you may imagine that this <laughs> opens up <laughs> huge issues in terms of uh, logistics, but not for today. That's a cut. Another big cut is um, law and territoriality. For those of you who have an interest in philosophy of law, Westphalia onwards, 1648 onwards, uh, we glued these two things together in a way that became so obvious. My place, my rules, your place, your rules. How simple, how obvious. Well, I mean, it took, no, uh, basically you know, World War Zero to get there. Now, uh, if you don't remember when this happens, you may remember the Three Musketeers and 20 years later. When they meet again, the Three Musketeers, Westphalia has happened. So the Richelieu is just you know, and messing around with the Three Musketeers before Westphalia. When they meet again, uh, the, the Musketeers, Westphalia has happened. Uh, and the Westphalian state is organized around the territoriality of the law. Now, for another day, maybe for the Q&A, but this is immense. The GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the new legislation on AI, AI Act, anything that's got to do with the right to be forgotten, Google, is all based on the detachment of territoriality and law. Because of course, if you block, for example, Google dot something in Europe, so that you cannot have access to those data, et cetera, et cetera, well, it's totally useless because google.com is one click away as the French complain when we were doing you know, uh, consultancy for, uh, for, the, uh, for Google on the right to be forgotten. But then what you have to explain to the French despite the three musketeers is that yes, welcome to a post-Westphalian world in which these two things have been completely unglued. Now this is part of the digital, ungluing, separating something that we both ontologically the law, the territorial the border, and mentally, epistemologically, we have come to consider two sides of the same coin. Now, what about gluing together? Well, one is a, is a word that uh, has become uh, very popular, which I coined for the uh, European Commission many, many years ago. We needed to talk about the impact of digital technologies on um, the uh, life, the everyday life of uh, European citizens. And I needed a word that meant both online and offline. That meant that it doesn't mean anything anymore to ask whether you are online or offline in some corners of the world, ours included. Because at least because you have a mobile phone in your pocket, you are being geotagged 24 seven anyway. So in what sense you are offline or online, et cetera. It's much, much better to start talking about the experience of an on life continuum where a mix and match of these two things happen all the time. Or, data and identity. The European legislation describes us as data subjects, literally. And this is, again, not for today, but if you see the conceptual design behind, it's beautiful. The digital detaches the territoriality and the law, and therefore, how can you protect your citizens if the border doesn't count anymore? You reattach the data to the subject, and therefore, you start talking about data subjects. So no matter where you are as a company, you have to abide by the laws, not in terms of gluing together territoriality and law, but in terms of a new gluing together of things that were completely separate, meaning data and identity in terms of personal identity and data subjects. This is the debate about privacy. So we stop here, but I hope you get the sense of how huge all this and how desperate people are for people like, forgive me for the self congratulatory moment, for people like us. People who actually see these things and they say, yeah, of course, 
I know how to do this. This is what I, I mean. When you need the Marines for problem solving, we are the Marines for problem solving. I mean, the, you need special forces? Call a philosopher, for goodness sake, because we do this you know, for breakfast. And they say, oh, yeah, really? No, you can actually do all this conceptual design, or if you like conceptual engineering in your Mac. Yeah, that, that sounds you know, part, part and parcel of what we do every day. That's why you know, uh, the Google and the Facebook and you know, the, 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 the German government or, or UNESCO and so on, they, they just need the sort of training that we get uh, in doing this. Now, enough of self congratulatory that was the warming up. So what about design? Well, design, I told you, is the counterpart or the cut and paste. So one idea so far, digital, digital revolution, cut and paste of modernity, two examples. So what? Well, we can do more because we have more cut and paste available. Now, for another day, but innovation comes in many forms, but there are fundamentally three. Uh, you either invent something, the wheel, <laughs> you discover something, America, or you design something, the iPhone. And every age, since we scratched the first cow on the walls of a cave, we've been doing these three things in different sort of mix and match. Uh, discovery without invention is totally useless. What can I do with that discovery if I don't invent a way of exploiting it? Uh, but the invention, and this sounds vaguely Kantian, I hope to some of you, without design is unusable. I mean, you know, I might invent something that is so cumbersome, so uh, expensive, so uh, resource greedy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, but no. So you need to put all these things together in one go. Let me tell you something more about design and then back to these three components. So what is design? The design can, is defined in, in many different ways and actually it's a shame. If you look at the um, uh, shelf in the philosophy library, ideally, where books by philosophers on design are one next to the other, it is this big. 10, 15, make it 20 books that actually had design as a topic. Invention, discovery, you got libraries, okay? You can't be an expert no, because there's more to read than, than your lifetime. You can become an expert on philosophy or design, uh, I would say six months, 12 months, because there's not much. I don't know why. We seem to have been using as philosophers this concept like a Cinderella, you know, uh, behind the scenes all the time. It, to me, it's like information. Yeah. You, uh, before start doing the work I did, it's not before, no. Coining the, the expression of philosophy information, it's not that there wasn't no work done on it. No, you must be joking. But we were using it as a tool, but we're not, we're not sort of uh, conceptualizing properly how we were using it, what, what, what it meant, how did it work. So I'm sure there are many ways of describing uh, what design is. And this, by the way, is a classic Italian example I couldn't uh, sort of miss. Um, I can tell you more why that is a good example in case you have uh, uh, questions. But you have an affordance, first of all. The affordance there was a, a leftover from the Second World War. Gazillions of those small uh, wheels for small airplanes that nobody knew what to do with them. You have a constraint, one or more. You need to build something that um, is cheap, uh, doesn't consume too much. Uh, you have a problem to solve. In this case, mobility for a purpose. You want to have a, a, a good, say, um, uh, moped or motorbike or something that uh, transports people with those wheels, no, not too expensive, maybe a couple of people, that's what single person for us. Uh, so you have a purpose, say a business purpose. And that's, that's your design. You put together all these things in a way that is imaginative, um, that takes full advantage of, of the uh, affordances, respects the constraints, solves the problem successfully in view of the purpose. Job done. And the engineer will actually, uh, um, designed the first Vespa, that's what you have in front of you, hated having something between his legs. His reports are funny. He said, oh, I want to have something that you can sit on, like a chair, like a sofa, like a nice sort of, and there you go. So that's how you get uh, something. So back to us, why design is the counterpart of cut and paste? So imagine, as a philosopher, you can, uh, you have a mental uh, experiment for a moment. You are alone in the universe. There's nothing else, just you and the universe and a stone in front of you. And no reference to the philosopher's stone, just a stone, a normal stone. Uh, what can you do with that stone? You can kick it, you can lick it, 
You can scratch yourself with that stone, but you can do no design. There's nothing to design with it because it's a single piece of something. But imagine there you cut and paste that stone. You got many stones. You already have a lot of design. One on top of each other, you can have an arch, you can put them next to each other, a little wall. So I hope that this is sufficiently intuitive to understand that the more you cut and paste, the more you have affordances and the constraints are lower. At that point, the digital world becomes the age of design. But that's why, I mean, there's nothing mysterious. You lower you know, the, 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 the threshold of constraints, you, you know, put much, much higher the number of, of affordances that are in your hands, and there, all of a sudden, the added value to what we do is a design issue. Now, for another day, not for today, uh, but how do you drive design, value-driven uh, design, and everything else? That's for you know, an ethics debate that is for another day. But design here means more than just industrial design, which I used to introduce to you. It's design of everything we do, institutions, legislations, business models, lifestyles, sustainability, you name it. Anything that we do in a sort of creative, inventive, imaginative pour out of something, that to me is designing the world. So it becomes a powerful force. That's why I thought conceptual engineering was a little bit too restrictive uh, for what I meant uh, also philosophically. At that point, uh, the counterpart of the digital screening power, detach or glue together, is design. And you have this bit of dialectic between how much you detach, how much you can re reattach, and how much you can design. Now this, in other contexts, for example, is Uber. Uber detaches the driver, no, license as a cab driver from no, the possibility of actually bringing someone from A to B to C. You detach those two things, all of a sudden you can design a lot of models. And when people start talking in industry of Uberization of a sector, that is exactly what they're talking about. Detachment, reattachment, in view of a design that re-puts together things in a, in a way that is innovative and hasn't been uh, done before. But I told you that this is warming up to the real business that we want to cover today. So innovation is like a stool. It took me a little while to find this picture uh, because this is a stool with a leg that is longer and forward. Um, today, that stool, the leg forward is designed, but discovery and invention have to be there. Right? Don't get me wrong. I mean, you don't get the iPhone without discovery and invention at the same time. It's just that what drives the innovation is the design. And you know, I've already mentioned the iPhone too many times, but now if you look at the back of the iPhone, it says design in California. That's what matters. Wherever you make it. Today is made in China, tomorrow, South Korea. Now, maybe one day in Scotland, another day in Italy. It does not matter where you make it. Is that the design in California that makes the whole difference. So we live uh, in an age of design. Uh, as you know, we have been through ages of discoveries, ages of inventions. Our age is, an age is the age of design. How can we understand better this design business? I gave a little bit of a, uh, an introduction. Uh, I told you a couple of things of why I think it's so important to focus philosophically on this concept. Provided a quick uh, semi-definition of what I mean by design. We've been here before, and that's where I start introducing some classic stuff. So to the surprise of my students who are not all social scientists or computer scientists or data scientists, I tell them, look, when you write your master thesis, you will be either Kantian or Hegelian. You will either be looking at the reasons why something is the way it is, conditions of possibility, transcendental conditions of possibility, or you will be looking at whatever you have and what puts that system in some kind of equilibrium, what tensions, what conflicts need to be resolved. I'll tell you more about this much more uh, specifically, but those two sort of uh, logics, um, and I call them logics in a sort of very modern sense, not of course, uh, sort of conceptual logic, um, these two uh, mechanism, if you prefer the expression, have dominated modernity and also the way we do uh, even science and research these days. Now, of course, we don't speak in those terms, uh, but Pretty much, uh, I hope to convince you that that's the way it is. So here is how to present it more analytically. So Kant's trans transcendental logic, conditions of possibility of a system under investigation. What goes hand in hand with that? 
causal and genetic forms of reasoning, identification of answer insufficient conditions, past oriented analysis of what must have been the case or something else to be the case, the natural sciences. That's what you get. By buying into that Kantian perspective, you immediately know that's the package, so to speak. All of a sudden, you're talking about physics, you're talking about you know, uh, that, that, that kind of world, chemistry, biology, and, and so on. How does it work uh, more specifically? So you have some kind of system in the world. Uh, it could be you know, stars in the sky, or whatever. And, so. and uh, you have a purpose. Why are you asking the questions you ask? This is fundamental, and I hope to go back to this if you need to. Uh, that purpose determines a particular specific level of abstraction at which you are analyzing a system. So imagine the system is a building in town. Your purpose is navigation. Your level of abstraction is, can you tell me how to get from here to there and reach that building? Or if that is your purpose, then the level of abstraction will be no, geographic so, uh, conditions in, the, in town, uh, move from here to there, traffic light. And someone said, oh, look, yes, of course, no. Go here, then. So the system, for example, at this stage, it doesn't matter what the system is, is that building there. Now imagine if someone says, um, oh, is it the same? Is it the same system? So if you are navigating, say, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. No, don't worry about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's that building. But so, no, look, it's not the same. It doesn't matter. I, when you reach that building, turn right. But it was a hospital. Now it's a school. I don't care. The purpose is navigation. But if the purpose is, now, I need to know what's going on in that building, but the level of abstraction is completely different. It's no longer navigation, it's nature of the system in question. Change the purpose, no navigation, but for example, uh, knowing what's going on in the building, you change the level of abstraction, you change the system. Oh, by the way, what I'm doing here is 101 formal methods computer science, okay, just in case. You think that this is a, a, a possibly obvious? Let me ask you the, the next question. Is it the same system who is asking? The tax, pay, the tax man, no. Yes, it is the same system, my dear Theseus. I don't care about your ship. Is it the same ship? You have to pay your taxes. Collector, not at all. It changed all the fucking planks. There's a completely different play, uh, piece of something. I'm not gonna pay for that ship the same price. So the question, is the Theseus ship the same or not the same? Stop asking empty questions. Without level of abstractions, that question has no answer whatsoever. It's a game. It's a game for philosophers who want to waste their time. This is not relativism, because of course, depending on the purpose, you can judge whether the level of abstraction is adequate or not. So there is a way of comparing, but you need to give me a frame. Once you have that, uh, that particular level of abstraction generates a model, a description, to put it uh, in non-philosophical terms, you know, uh, that captures some kind of structure of that particular system. Okay, which belongs to. So this is what we normally do in any modeling, you know, in the pretty trivial sciences outside of uh, the world, you know, engineering stuff. I'll come back to this in a moment. What about Kant? Well, Kant will tell you that what you need to do when you look at the structure of the system is to look at the conditions of possibility. So if that is a, a fridge or a building or the planetary system, whatever, how did he get there? How, how come is that way? What are these conditions supposed to be exactly? Fine. What's the difference with Hegel? Well, in a moment, Kant's logic, conditional possibility, you get the system and you go back in history, so to speak. How about the dialectical logic? What is the study of dynamic equilibrium? Something that people would probably be horrified, but uh, it's pretty much game theory. Uh, that, you know, what's the best way of getting uh, here? Uh, of course, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of German, uh, sometimes unintelligible sense, but you no, know, if you read Hegel from that perspective, it makes a lot of uh, sense. Uh, so what you're dealing with is polarized and procedural ways of reasoning. You identify contrast, their resolutions, present-oriented analysis of process and mutual interactions, social sciences. You don't find Kant very popular among social scientists, but Hegel is everywhere. Political science, economics. How come? Well, because you know, you're looking at a system, you're looking at the equilibrium, and you have a bit of a dialectical logic where you can start making sense of no, this against that and you can you know, get to a synthesis and so on. It makes a lot of sense in a sort of uh, um, gentle way of doing this. So you still have the same kind of uh, uh, pattern, but you look at the condition of stability of the system, no longer the conditions of possibility. 
not how he got there, but how can he keep being what it is? Uh, say international relations, how come the, the China, US, AI as a, as a weapon, et cetera, dialectical, et cetera, can't, mm, not so much. Uh, so Hegel, the system and how the system stays as it were on itself, running in place, uh, if you pass me the metaphor. You can see there's something missing. I already told you what it is. Um, so uh, fast forward, blueprint. What I told you so far is enormously popular. It works well. Two fantastic chapters, two tools in our bag, and I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, fantastic, great. I want to use them when I need them. You find them, for example, in uh, uh, great uh, philosophers, Marx, Trivial, or Husserl, with Kant, in case Husserl was not under the radar. And they are not incompatible. The double negative is not just an English way of putting it. You read Foucault and it's just not incompatible, meaning they mess around. You read Foucault and one time is a bit, no, condition of possibility, another time is about, no, conditions of equilibrium, and he mixed this around with plenty of analogies from uh, geography. No, things that move, but don't move, they come from somewhere, all a mess there. But if you have these two perspectives, and oh, okay, he's being Kantian today, the next chapter is going to be more Hegelian, and they're not incompatible, but you need to be a little bit sort of gentle with interpretation, more or less. That's my no, best way of uh, saving for core. Huh? Uh, but they both, both investigate things that are already there. And they, they don't know me, like so classic glasses uh, on your nose, they're like, there. So the natural universe, human history, you know, one, the other, a mix of the two, but they are not meant to help you to put things there. They're not logic of design or something that hasn't been you know, already created. So they move from the system to the model, as opposed from the model to the system. So neither is a conceptual logic of construction of poiesis. And by the way, just to remind everybody here, is, that, uh, is an Oxford philosopher talking, or the analytic kind, or the realist kind. No funny things about the world is not out there, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking about building what we conceptually have in our minds in a very concrete way and building the world around us. So they move from the model, uh, now understood as a prescription, as a blueprint, to its implementation as a realized system. That's, that's the missing step, the, the third step that we need to add. So what we need here is a design logic of conditions of feasibility, not just of possibility, can't, or stability, but how, can I build this? Can I actually do this? Now, mind that um, another concept that if anyone wants to write a PhD thesis on, on it, no, the world is yours, trade-off. Everybody and his uncle use that concept. No one really knows what they're talking about. Oh, yeah, of course, we need to have some trade-off, meaning but that's you know, the idea of a feasibility of a solution where some trade-offs and, and pro and contra and equilibrium, but in terms of building that, not just in terms of what is already there. Oh, by the way, I'm presenting this as if there were three separate things, not interacting, but of course, as I told you about Foucault, then all these things get mixed on the same dish, but better be, no, better separate first and then mix rather than make a big soup and not understanding anything. So how does that work? These conditions of feasibility? The model at this point is a blueprint, just to have a precise word that uh, doesn't uh, lead us into uh, confusion. Here's what it looks like. You don't have the iPhone. You have a purpose in mind. You are Steve Jobs. You have a particular level of abstraction. In that case, the level of abstraction is the level of abstraction of a user, uh, user-friendly uh, blueprint. That's the blueprint, the actual blueprint of the iPhone 5, as you can uh, read. The level of abstraction generates the blueprint, identifies a particular kind of structure, the conditions of feasibility, and you finally build the object that you didn't have before. There's no Kant, there's no Hegel here. There is a logic of design. This is not transcendental, it is not dialect. It can be combined with, but it's sufficiently different beasts. No, it's not a mule, it's not a horse, it's a zebra, okay? <laughs> so sufficiently different to say, well, it's a kind of different animal here. That's just because it has four legs and looks like a horse. No, we shouldn't get confused. Fine. So. At this point, we have from the model to the system, from the system to the model, and the system staying on itself, and we have the, uh, the whole thing put together. So these are, to me, the three conceptual logics of information understood as information about something. 
either model or blueprint, depending on how you want to. Of course, information has many meanings, uh, and trust me, you know, we can waste uh, uh, an hour just talking about that, but not for today. Uh, if you don't like the word information there, just use replace it with model slash blueprint, and it will be the same. Uh, I don't see any other logic here uh, missing, but no, who knows, maybe someone will come up with something else. But either system you know, is understood in terms of how you, you, you got there, how it stands there, or how you put there in the first place by uh, having not the system already there, but building the system uh, from, uh, from scratch. What's the logic behind this? How does that? How does it work? And that's the thing that when you start looking at uh, other people, surely we're not the first ones to talk about design and the logical design, etc. So I found, among many other things, this particular helpful. Uh, I hope you share my view, but if not, no, please uh, feel free to uh, investigate around the world. Um, these are the five phases of design presented by the American Institute for Architects. And I think they are, they are adaptable to almost any uh, sort of logical design. First of, all, first of all, you need to have something, but that's obvious. Uh, in that case, a house, shall we say. Then you need to focus, phase two. Define the system scope, features, purpose, functionality. I will call them requirements next because I'm going to use terminology that is um, inherited from uh, software engineering, but the same idea. What they call focus is for uh, a software engineer uh, requirements. Then you need to implement those requirements, design the system, shape it, no? build the house. Then, of course, you build the whole thing and you live there uh, uh, physically and you live there, you occupy and start again if it doesn't work. And so, so, the two phases, two and three, to me, they represent the element that we need to understand the logic of design that uh, I've spoken about before how you define the system and how you implement the system. And to do that, I said, I'm going to borrow something from system engineering. Uh, that's one of the many legs uh, <laughs> or many hats. That's, that's less disturbing that I, I went. Um, I'm also in the computer science department uh, over here. Um, when you specify a system that needs to be designed to a software engineer, but any engineer, they will ask you for requirements. Essentially, what do you need? So you are a customer and I, I'm the engineer. You come to see me and say, look, I want you to build, say, uh, a network of ATM for my bank. Okay, what are your requirements? For example, safety, usability, cost, accessibility, and so on. So all these things that need to be there for the design to be successful. So the requirements need to be satisfied by the build system. And then to the logician already rings a bell the satisfaction thing. So you, we can shorten this. These are all shortcuts. And if you don't like them, drop them. And it's just, uh, no, instead of using a lot of English. Um, so you have the no, specification for the system, spec of S as system, defined as a set of requirements. And it's a final set. You can't be vague because uh, no, you are the bank. I'm the engineer. I need to know how many and exactly what requirements you have. You can't come tomorrow and say, no, sorry, drop two and add two more. That's a mess. So it's not an open-ended set of requirements. It's from one to n set of requirements that, that sort of, um, apply to uh, the particular system. Good. A bit of effort now, because this, the requirements, again, in Wikipedia level, they can be functional or non-functional. And that's what I'm, I think it's useful to introduce at this stage. Um, the example is trivial, and actually that is the real uh, uh, design of uh, the, the first uh, refrigerator uh, function in uh, 1901. Um, some requirements are non-functional in the following sense. They tell you what the system is supposed to be, not what the system is supposed to do. Next slide, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So for example, a refrigerator's non-functional requirements is that it has a compartment, is thermally insulated, and easily accessible in order to store food. It's a design requirement. You can get it immediately. But it doesn't tell you what it does. It tells you how it is shaped, what it's supposed to be, as opposed to what it's supposed to do. It doesn't tell you anything about cold or hot or anything. But then, uh, that's the next step. You need to have also requirement in terms of what does it do? 
refrigerator function requirements, maintain constant temperature, a few degrees above the freezing point of water inside this easily accessible thermal insulated compartment. But that is, is its action, so to speak. Now, once you have that distinction, and every engineer in, in this room, uh, virtual room, will understand that, yeah, of course, no, I don't need to be told another time. Um, we get, we're getting there. Here's a philosophical example, just in case. Remember the, uh, the category imperative by Kant? Uh, so how can, look, it has to be empty, but at the same time tells me, tells me what to do. Oh, this is a contradiction, something is not quite squaring here. Well, if you interpret it as a formal motivational feature for an agent's behavior, then you are understanding Kant in terms of functional requirements. Yeah. What to do as opposed to what to be. But from a system design, it's way more consistent with the Kantian view that I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you what kind of agent to be to interpret that as non-functional requirements, like universal universalizability and non-instrumentalization. So these two uh, features of my actions, they don't tell me what to do, but they are description of what to be as opposed to what to do. So they're non-functional as opposed to function. Now, whether you find this <laughs> intuitive as I do, <laughs> but you can tell I've been doing this for too long, or the what the heck is going on here, uh, I leave it to that as a, as a simple example uh, of how you start reading with this perspective a lot of philosophy from a very interesting you know, uh, point of view. Back to us, what do we do with this? Well, remember, we need to put now all together. We have a purpose according to which we are designing a particular system. The purpose determines the level of abstraction at which we will describe the system. I can tell you much more about the level of abstraction methodology. Let me just warn you about one thing. It's not ontological, first of all. It doesn't tell you that that's the way the world is structured. No, it just is a, is a framework, literally. It's an interface, um, as a strict, strictly speaking, uh, through which to interpret the world. And unfortunately for the terminology, not mine, it comes as I said from formal methods in, in computer science when you need to analyze systems or build systems, levels are not hierarchical. So imagine two levels uh, of abstraction about the same house, that's the system that you want to describe in this case, and one is the architects, the other one is the buyers. They're not one on top of each other, they're not hierarchical, and you could have another one which is the collector, and another one which is the no, city council uh, interface. So imagine level of abstractions as interfaces. There is a way of formalizing also dynamic interfaces. They are called gradient of abstraction, but all this is, is extra stuff that we don't need today. Just think in terms of level, level of abstractions as interfaces, which are selected for a particular purpose because you want to address a particular question or particular problem. Then you have some requirements in terms of resources. Now for us, it will be conceptual resources. Uh, I often said in the past that if you, uh, uh, a, you are a believer and you believe that God exists, that is an immense resource for philosophy. It's amazing what you can do once you have the existence of God in your design. Uh, at the same time, it can be a, a big glitch because the Theodician problem is a design problem for your system because you have a God, you have best features, and that doesn't square well, for example, with no, no, uh, human evil and natural evil. So not so easy, but... That's the kind of sense in which philosophers have conceptual resources to put at play one kind of requirement. Then you want that particular system you're designing to do something, the function, remember the functional requirements, more uh, requirements. And then you have a particular architecture. Remember the fridge is done in, in its building that way. It's like that, not like that, uh, more requirements. So resources, architecture, functions, they all lead to a global sense of what requirements you have identified. Once you have the top uh, so, uh, over here uh, requirements business, then you know what you're facing. You know what it takes to get down that particular road and build, uh, design that system. The system is finally no, the object of your design. All this um, helps us to understand a little bit the logic of uh, design as a logical requirements. Let me show you the, the previous slide. You can tell that everything here is, the, is determined by requirements. What is required for this to happen, for this to be designed that way, for those resources to be used properly, 
I didn't put there the affordances, but you remember design, etc. So it is always, it seems to me, a matter of requirements. So if anyone wants to discuss the logical design, he should really get that in terms of a logical requirements. So here comes you know, three or four slides with a bit of text. So what relation is there between a set of requirements and a system that implements them, makes them real in the world? Now, we know that this turnstile, the semantic turnstile, so to speak, uh, indicates satisfaction in, in, a, in a normal logical context, within a model, through structure, and the left, and a set of sentences on the right, the structure is a model for satisfy the set of sentences. Fine. So that's what you write you know, in your you know, 101 introduction to baby logic, et cetera, S, et cetera, and satisfy. But the requirements have the opposite direction, so to speak. You've got the requirements first, which then are satisfied by the system, not the other way around, when the system is not yet there. At some point, when it's there, of course, the arrow uh, goes in the other direction. So if we want to have something uh, that goes visually, so to speak, just intuitively, not for the ease of discussion for us, that has the requirements leading to then that relation of conducing to S, uh, we can pull that sort of uh, symbol there uh, as a little help. And uh, that word is horrible, uh, makes sufficient or suffi sufficientizes something. But no, we philosophers are used to other horrible words like necessitates, and it's the counterpart, so to speak. So this is not deduction, of course, it's not induction and it's not abduction. So if we need a word, maybe not, but it's conduction, if you like. <laughs> so the requirements on the left conduce to the system to be designed on the right. Now, there's a bit of a story here uh, to make the, the talk a bit of light, and then I'll come back to something more serious. A long, long time ago, uh, I know this is on record, so uh, apologies to the students who were subject to this uh, little torture a long, long time ago. A long, long time ago in a different galaxy, uh, I was a college tutor in Oxford, and you had to select candidates for philosophy courses. And one thing that I used to uh, have repeatedly is the following question. Please define a chair. And you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to define a chair without getting a puff, a stool, an armchair, or something else. Back to us. Um, if you have as requirements seat one person for only two requirements, they conduce to a variety of objects, a chair, a stool, and a puff. They all are there satisfying backwards you know, the, the requirements. And to put it in terms of a you know, chronological uh, perspective, those requirements sufficient, sufficientize the chair, the stool, and the puff. This will come back uh, later when uh, there will be a, an Anna Karen in a moment, but more on that uh, just in a while. So, because I taught logic for 15 years, you can't resist. So what happens if I don't have uh, any requirements? No, you get just an S, just the system. S is made sufficient by the empty set of requirements. No requirement is provided about what is to be implemented. So basically you get S for free. Uh, which is very suspicious. Uh, you, it's, it's kind of anything goes. Whatever you do, as uh, pops up, not gratuitously. Uh, but strange. Um, what about the, the, no, if you make a bar on the uh, suffi sufficientizes something? Um, you can't have uh, that system. Uh, it's impossible. Then you move, on, of course, to too many, including boundless requirements and or inconsistent requirements. Bingo, you don't have a system. You've got a requirements in which something has to be at the same time uh, uh, read and not read. Sorry, I can't build that object. Uh, so there is no system to change. Then you can have uh, something that uh, with consistent requirements that conduce to a unique system, only one uh, system uh, satisfies them, seat one person as a back, nothing else, no arms, and as a chair. So a chair, uh, and the set of requirements have that special relationship of going left, right, right, left. And you can play with that a little bit, but this, as I said, are more like shortcuts to show you that helps all this. Back to more serious business. We can do a little bit of verification and validation. Now, for the philosophers among us, I cannot stress this strongly enough. 
They have nothing to do with the concept in philosophy and in logic. They, have the, they use the same word. So verification here is not the philosophical concept, and validation is not the logical concept. But in software design, they use them, or in any design, meaning engineering, use them all the time. Anything you have in your house, has, if it's been designed properly, has been verified and validated. Meaning, at some point, people have asked the following two questions. Are we building the right thing? And whatever we're building, are we building it in the right way? Verification, validation. Now, these two things enable us to check the fitness for purpose of the artifact. And I wouldn't mind if it were not too messy for our philosophical sort of, uh, discipline to import these senses into our own way of describing, for example, a particular theory. Uh, a philosophical theory is that fit for the purpose for which it has been built. I want to verify and validate that theory. But in that sense, it will build the right thing. And we did that rightly. There is also a sense of anti-relativism, because the one thing that I notice in, in, in other contexts is that once you start talking about like, abstractions, validation, verification, building the system, etc., the temptation is to say, oh, okay, well then anything, not at all. Of course not. Not anything counts as a chair, does it? Same idea, exactly the same idea. So first of all, you can optimize in design and improve in the number of nature of the requirements and or in the implementation according to some pre-established purpose. You can do better. And that's why, for example, uh, some people spend a lot of time on other philosophers' ideas optimizing. How many optimization of the language gain can we get? Uh, and so on. Or, and or, or the bell, the logician, or, you can do more efficiency in design. Implementation of a set of requirements such that it is impossible to satisfy any of them without satisfying a little bit less some other. For those of you who are used to the, the, the jargon, that's Pareto efficiency. Uh, you can't do any better than that without someone being dissatisfied with the, with the new solution, no, et cetera. Optimization and efficiency work against relativism. But the main thing that works against relativism is to fix the purpose for which you have the level of abstraction at which da, 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 and et cetera, falls. So at this point, we allow me to start landing uh, uh, the talk with more uh, general uh, points. Why all this is important? Why a conceptual logical design today? Well, first of all, because our knowledge of the world is increasingly constructionist, not constructivist in some French weird way where there is nothing, is all a social construction, whatever you want, my interpretation, your interpretation. And in, at the end of the day, it's always the fault of a white man enlightenment kind of business. I don't think so. In the serious sense in which we build a lot of things around us, our institutions, our business models, our artifacts, even our lives, even our own identities are a matter of design. So, our moral action, and so on. A lot of that is a matter of construction in the very concrete, strong sense. And some of the sciences that we have around already anticipate this. Uh, they make a biggest difference in our lives, computer science and economics. They build their own subjects. Um, they don't just study their subjects. So this means that, and that's, and again, for another talk, another day, another time, when you hear people talking about Galileo and you know, the famous phrase, so, now, the book on nature is written in mathematical language. Two points here are fundamental. One, he meant something else about mathematical language. In fact, he said he meant mathematics. But what he meant to really, no, if you read the whole passage, he meant geometry. We moved away from that because then, no, they can't, no, they, we, we, you, the algebraization of geometry, then the algebraization of algebra, then the logicization of, of mathematics, and that, do, 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 do. today for us means, oh, numbers. No, 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 he meant really triangles and shapes and so on. Uh, but having said that, um, that is amazing because until Galileo, the view was that God, the architect, the designer, was writing essentially two books, the Bible and the universe. One semantics, the other one ontologically, no, actually putting stuff there. What he does is, for the first time, as far as we know, is that he puts together with God's writing, no, humanity's reading. And that is the real novelty. Otherwise, no. The fact that the Book of Nature is written in mathematical language, that would not uh, be uh, innovative. It's the reading that we have, all the science that we do. 
And that shows the first half of the, of the journey. Science as, as a mimetic or reading uh, sort of, uh, enterprise. But increasingly, we are driving the universe. When you talk about computer science or, or AI, we are adding, in the metaphor, new pages to the universe, mathematical language and so on. So at that point, the writing is done by us. And once you do the writing, there are a couple of things that we cannot explore today, but fundamental. One, the classic introduction to philosophy of science textbook is missing a big chunk <laughs> because the classic introduction to the philosophy of science textbook is on mimetic sciences. And most of the time it's about physics anyway, <laughs> or perhaps a little bit chemistry, a little bit biology, but it will not, it, it, or very little cover normally, uh, things like uh, law, economics, computer science, architecture, the sciences that are actually not poetic. But the second thing, not for us today, trust me, that we already put enough on the plate, is that once you move from mimesis to poiesis, and the movement is from chapter one to chapter two, not like, oh, we abandon one. No, 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 we put them together. You start realizing that a lot of the poiesis that we're doing today feeds back into the, the mimetic approach because nothing that's going on at the CERN in, sort of, uh, in the physics of particles today is ending but taking a photocopy of what's going on in the world, increasingly we have to modify and change and force, construct the world in order for the world to talk to us, Francis Bacon and so on. We need to torture it a little bit uh, to make sure that it gives us uh, the, day, the data that we need. So the cycle starts being mimesis for yes and mimesis. So don't get me wrong, we put them the two together, but we lean on the poiesis increasingly. Once we do that, there's another talk for another day, which is the maker's knowledge tradition. Because if you're writing, <laughs> you're also reading your own stuff. And so that's where I'm afraid I'm increasing less Kantian in a certain way. Because the noumenon, once you have put the noumenon there yourself, <laughs> it's your own stuff. You better know what, you, what you're talking about. Now this goes against Plato and against Kant. Plato, because of course he hates technology and love epistemology. So the better guy who knows something is the guy who actually uses it. Well, try to explain that to anyone who has to fix this mobile phone. Uh, no, me and the engineer. So I think we got the wrong end of the stick over there, but that's for another day. But also Kant uh, and the idea that reality in, in itself is unknowable, what well, becomes more in terms of um, non-exhaustible by our knowledge. So it's not that you cannot know it, but you cannot exhaust the amount of information you can extract from the world. So there is an endless, boundless amount of understanding. And to close this note, footnote, there's a debate which I still have to investigate. So work in progress. One day, maybe when I retire, philosophy of technology post-Kantian who crashed against, exactly against the noumenon. Late German philosophy, philosophy of technology, post-Kantian, trying to square this thing. I built the bloody thing. And you tell me I don't know what it is in itself? Oh, well, I, well, maybe I don't know, say, the the metal, the materials, but I do know the iPhone because I have the blueprint of it. In that case, the Kantian perspective that the only person that can actually have knowledge of the noumenon is God because not God creates the noumenon. Well, actually, once you have a post-Galilean, I write the book that I'm reading, goes a little bit you know, downhill. But as I said, that's too much for today. Back to the topic. Second point, why is it so important today? Well, because today we need to design new answers to open questions posed by the information revolution. And this is, as I said, a more generic and we're almost at the end of my talk. A few more slides and they're actually quite light. Um, I like to describe the philosophy, the questions that we address as philosophers as open questions. Uh, I have a paper about this, you can check it. It's more complicated, I want to put it here, forgive me. But the idea is that they are ultimate, no absolute, remember, no absolute as in there is no level of abstraction. Absolute questions, absolute mess. Do not ever ask whether the zero ship is or is not the same. That is ridiculous. Full pop. I, I, just, I just walk out of the room. It's because you want to play games. Tell me whether it's the taxman who is asking or the collector. And then we have a question. They're not answerable in full empirically or mathematically. Otherwise, we would have simply, gently, you know, delegated other people to do that. They're open to inform and rational disagreement. 
That is my reply normally to the fellow uh, at a table in college who says, oh, my dear philosopher, but philosopher never solved anything. How silly. Of course, because you left to us the unanswerable questions. So thank you for leaving us the hard job <laughs> of designing you know, solutions for questions that are intrinsically open. So of course we cannot come up with the final finish end of the story answer because otherwise you would have done it yourself, my dear fellow in physics, chemistry, mathematics, or biology, sociology, geography, whatever. So it's the other way around. It's because you don't have a place where to dump your, your open questions that we are taking care of it. So don't complain with us because we are cleaning you know, stuff that you couldn't claim. Why they are open to rational uh, and, and, and informed disagreement? Because you and I could be completely informed, very well informed, and completely rational and well-mannered. I want to have a dialogue with you and still end by disagreeing. And none of us is either stupid, uninformed, like dumb uh, or thick head or doesn't want to change. It's a matter of saying, do we, forgive me for the trivial point, do we or do we not want to organize a party on Friday? It's an open question. We may reach a conclusion, but don't tell me that there's the answer, as opposed to how many people are coming to the party, because that <laughs> is a mathematical question. And do we have enough food for how many people come to the party? Yes or no. But should we or should we not have a party on Friday? That is a philosophical question. Limited, stupid, elementary, as much as the mathematical question of how many people come and the empirical question of whether there's enough food, but still philosophical in its own end. Anyway, because we have more open questions today in a world that is changing under our eyes at an enormous speed and dramatically, well, we need more philosophy. Therefore, we need more conceptual design. Therefore, well, the kind of philosophy that I like to practice and preach is philosophy as conceptual design. In other words, something that is to uh, 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 translate, to, to borrow a word from uh, a technical term from uh, medical research, translational. Meaning that you know, translational research in medicine is the, the kind of research that you get a Nobel today for foundational research, and seven years later, your GP, your, no, general, your doctor, can actually give it to you as a tablet. That's translation. So it's not applied, it's not practical, it's not down the road, but it's not at the same time detached. I retire, I do what I please, because my real interest is in some metaphysical questions that no one will ever, trust me, give a damn about it. Now that is the philosophy for which we are you know, getting a bad press, a bad name. Because at some point, by doing all this conceptual design, we get enamored with the conceptual design. We start becoming even more and more Baroque, if you like, or Byzantine in our own speculations. And we forget that that conceptual design had a translational purpose. At some point, it was meant to make a difference in the world for someone somewhere down the road. So conclusion, and we are really there. At some point, I want to give you um, uh, just a, a sense of um, uh, doable. This is okay. I mean, there's a lot that we can do as philosophers, uh, conceptually speaking, um, by doing 100% philosophy in the classic sense. So this is um, Anna Karenina, at the very famous beginning, um, Tolstoy. Uh, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I think he was wrong. Unfortunately, Wikipedia, nothing special. Someone uh, thinks that um, uh, Jared Diamond, uh, 1997. Uh, oh, this is the AK principle. I hate when people do this. So I can anyway. So translates that, that particular sentence into this uh, mouthful. A deficiency in any one of a number of factors, requirements, dooms an endeavor to fail. So a successful endeavor is one where every possible deficiency has been avoided. Now, this is depressing. Because if you are in the design sort of business, either you get it right 100% or you are screwed. Luckily, it's completely, totally wrong. And I'll show you in a moment why. It's wrong because it was wrong since Aristotle. Uh, Tolstoy didn't invent anything, uh, or maybe he did, but he didn't know. But the same idea is already in Aristotle when he talks about success or lack of success. He says success is like playing darts. There's only one way of getting the bullseye. Anything else? All over the place. You're wrong. 
So either you get a bullseye or, sorry. Now, if that is a matter of design, it means that either you get, for example, that legislation, right? That new concept of what a uh, liberal democracy should be like in the 21st century. That new model of, say, uh, distributed uh, uh, citizen science, right? Or with that. Now, that sounds a little bit dramatic. Luckily, it's not true. It's not true even in mathematics. So this is a stupid uh, thing that uh, I put there just for the, the ones who like these kind of things. It's, the, it's, it's an equation that, of course, has infinitely many solutions. It's, it's just stupid. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a child game. But even in mathematics, you can have infinitely many solutions. And in design, how many chances do we have? Remember, the requirements are, no, it has to have uh, no, one person sitting there as a back, but no, the history of, of, uh, of chairs is full of good solutions. And these are all good chairs for different purposes, maybe for different contexts, different uh, environments, uh, different costs. So there are other ways of deciding, no. But two things, first of all, there's a multitude of good solutions. And that reminds us about philosophy. It is not true that in philosophy, either you find a solution or anything on anyone else, no. There's a space of problem solving that is sort of populated by good solutions, like good chairs. Of course, it depends on the context and which one you will choose, but don't tell me that those are not nine decent, perfectly fine chairs. At the same time, so not true that anything will count as a chair, not true that anything will actually you know, be a good design. So I think that uh, a better way of you know, rephrasing the AK principle, if you want to be fancy, is that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, Fix that way, and it will be happy like no other. That's not exactly uh, as catchy as Tolstoy, but I think it's closer to the truth. And with that, I want to not leave you with the last message. And if you remember one thing of this blah, blah, blah of mine, that's the, that's the, that's the take home message. The digital age is the age of design. It should be the age of good conceptual design. That's why philosophy should be at the core of this business, not in its ivory tower in the periphery, minding its own business. That is a scandal we cannot afford. Thank you.